Good Monday morning, my friends. It's September 14th, and I am here with two absolute Canvas rock stars. Kimberly from out in the east, ML from out in the west. We've got the special education queens with us right now, and they are going to rock a Canvas demo for you. Um, we're excited because we have a I'm, don't tell Kimberly and ML that I'm telling you this, but we've got a pretty big group that's here with us. They don't like to hear that because it makes them a little nervous, I think. No need to be nervous, my friends. So what we're going to do, as always, we want to know who you are. We see some people in here already telling us from Oregon, from Georgia, from Virginia, and on and on and on and on and on. Keep telling us who are you, where are you from. Any questions that you have for these incredible educators, drop them in the comments, and I'll be moderating that throughout, of course. Um, and we'll be on for the next little bit. So with that... ML, I'm going to hand it over to you to kick things off. All right. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is ML. I'm also known as Taglish Teacher on YouTube and on Facebook. So quick background, I am a high school special education teacher here in the San Diego area. I've been teaching for 18 years, and most of my students are mild moderate. Most of them are also diploma bound. Okay, so what that means is they're taking five general education classes, and then one class is actually special, special education, which is called study skills. So I teach that class too. So when I learned that we're gonna do Canvas for special education, I decided to put all of my students in one Canvas course. Um, I decided to do that because I wanted to work from this one Canvas course, and then I noticed that most of my students are actually sharing some of the goals, okay? So back in the beginning of July, I shared a YouTube video on my idea of creating student buttons and then linking them to web pages. So the plan was to kind of create their own path for them. And then initially I put it all in pages, but you know, with the privacy, because I can't really assign that, I decided to do a passcode using Canvas um, surveys. Now it got a little complicated. And after talking with a couple of teachers on Facebook, so shout out to Rachel Claire. She actually suggested that I just use assignments. So that's where I am now. And then I wanted to go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay. So what you see here is just a summary of all my IEP goals. And then you can see right here that I kind of just tabulated who's what. And then that's when I noticed that a lot of the students are actually sharing the same goal. Okay. So that's why I decided it's better for me to just put them all in one Canvas course. So let's look at my Canvas course really quick. Okay, so this is my Canvas course. The first step that I had to do was create a home page and then have the buttons in there. So let me just scroll really quick. Okay, so all of these are my students. They know their numbers, they know their buttons. So when they go in there, they know what to click. Now with the 22 students, so I don't know if this is just an issue with special, uh, with high school students, but Privacy is such a big deal. Um, two of them wanted to make sure that no one knows them to be receiving special education services. Their parents have spoken to me, and so that's kind of our deal. Like, So I had to make sure that when I put them in here, nobody else can see them. So what I had to do is I, there's two things that I had to do. So on navigation, as you can see, the people is up here. So what you would have to do is if, you, if you're in the same situation as me and you want to hide students from each other, drag that people down and just make sure you save it. OK, that takes away that tab that the students can click. Now, oddly, though, I found out that they can still see each other in the inbox section. So if they were to click here and then they actually search people on that side, they're going to see the other students. So, again, it's such a big deal for my kids. So what I had to do is I actually had to create sections. I think um, this is like a Canvas feature that could be turned on. I checked with a Canvas rep, and then he said it could be turned off and on by the district. So maybe in the future, Mark, that's something that if you guys could allow us to turn it off course per course, that would be really good for special education teachers so we don't have to section out our kids. It's also the same situation with resource people like the speech therapist. They have to do the sectioning because they don't want the other kids seeing each other. But it's pretty simple for now, so let's work around it. So you would click sections right there. As you can see, I already have three kids in there, right? So I would have 20 to all of them in there. So all you really have to do is, let me just try it. I personally use their student numbers um, or the numbers I gave them and then just give them the initial. So for example, student number four is TJ. I'm gonna click plus section, okay? So you're gonna have to do that for all your 22 students. 
Now, let's pretend that's done. So the next thing that you would have to do would be create your modules, okay? So my modules will be broken down by student. So as you can see, I have student one, two, three, four, so on and so forth, okay? Now, what's cool is that if you open it, because I use Canvas text header, I'm actually able to write all of their goals right here. So I have reading, which is annotating text, and I even put the accuracy that they need to hit. So that's very important for, for a student um, for special education. Now, if you look here, you're gonna see that we have, um, this student number two has only three goals, and then student number three has a total of six goals. So this is definitely how I plan to do it, create one module per student. Now, that's another feature that I hope could happen in the future. Maybe we can start assigning modules to each student. That will save us a lot of time, just so you guys are aware, okay? So let's pretend all is done. I've created my modules, I have my sections. The next step that I would do is actually go to my, start inviting my students, okay? So you'd click people. And then here, you're gonna go in and click plus people, type in the email, okay? And then make sure obviously they have the student role. And then what you would now do is just put them in the right section. So for example, let's add the fourth student, right? And then the most important thing is you want to click this. This will allow them to access you as a teacher and nobody else. So that's the biggest part of the privacy when it comes to sectioning out kids, okay? Then you will go ahead and just click next. And when the student accepts the invitation, then they become part of your course. So. Hey, ML. Yeah, sure. Really quick. So there was a question here. Let me go back. It was from Winnie. Uh, so Winnie was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that number system okay. that you were using. Yeah. So, um, I mean, so you're actually going to see Kimberly show a different method. But for me, okay. I just decided that I want my kids, I'm just assigning it. So I emailed all of my students and I said, hey, you're student number one in Canvas course. So whenever you go in there, you click just student number one and that's the only thing that you have to work on. So you can actually vary it. You can do colors. I've had teachers who actually do colors and I'm doing numbers and Kimberly's gonna show you really cute pictures of animals. So yeah, did I answer that question? Cool. All righty. So Let's go ahead and pretend that I'm a student. So I'm gonna click student view. So my, all of my students, all 22 of them will get in here and see this, right? So if I was student number one, I'm gonna go ahead and click one. Here, you can see this me welcoming them. And then here it reminds them that they are student number one, okay? So you're gonna see all the goals that they have, which is a total of, let's see, seven goals. I section them out, that way they remember that they have a reading goal, a writing goal, a math goal, study skills goal. Now, remember that this is now just an assignment, which means nobody can really see this but them, okay? And the way you would know, I, I can actually show that later if you have time, how you would do that. But this particular student, let's say they want to work on annotating text, so they click that. It takes them to this page. Now, this is just a page, it's very generic, all my students will have this. The only difference for each student is that it says number one, which is their assigned number, and then their initials, okay? So basic instructions, and then they will click next, right there. And then it takes them to the first assignment that I have published. So what I do with my students, I make sure that instructions are clear, everything's itemized, and then as you can see here, they just have to watch a video and provide answers by either typing it in the text box or actually recording themselves. So I realize that's an important thing because some students are more comfortable typing and some of them would rather just record themselves and submit that to me. So I'm okay with that, okay? And then once they're done, I have told my students that they only need to work on one task per sitting. Now, let's say they forgot that because they're teenagers, they're busy, and they click next. I made sure that I have a visual prompt. Just like how you would in your classroom, you know, you give verbal prompts, you give visual prompts. But because I'm doing virtual right now, I just make sure that I have this simple thing that says stop, you're done working for today, go on and work on something else. Now, let's go back and see how it would look like for student number two. So same idea, student number two clicks that. And as you can see, student number two has less goals because this student is actually a senior. So he's now just focusing on transition goals. So it would be the same steps though. They would click this and then follow the same idea of clicking the next task. 
what I like is whenever they're done with this, I will just unpublish it and then publish the next task that they need to do, which then becomes the new thing that they could click on the next time they sit down and work on their canvas. Hey, ML, let's take another one real quick. We've got we've got Maria on YouTube that's asking, do you co-teach? If you do co-teach, how do you track the goals for the students in your co-taught classes? Are these numbers just for students on your caseload? Yes, so these numbers are just for my students on my caseload. And then we actually took out co-teaching this year, but I am visiting all the other students in their other Canvas course. Now, it really varies per district, but for us, what we're doing is we're going to be allowed access to their Canvas courses and to their Zoom sessions, and I will be visiting there and making sure that the goals are being met. If for whatever reason the gen ed teacher is not really handling that, you know, that specific goal, I'll be making sure to assign them assignments using this method right here. So I'll be pushing out at their own time unless they're with me in a study skills class. Perfect. Thank you. Okay. All right. So the last thing on the bottom that I wanted to show are generic buttons that I have here. So the first one, let's start here. This class is just like a syllabus because, you know, the kids are probably confused why they have this. Right. So I made sure I explained it to my my teenagers that this is not going to be credited. OK, it's just for me to give you goals and then nothing here is going to be graded. So that's important for them because GPAs are big with us. Then this one right here is just um, can actually let me get out of here really quick. So let me go back. There we go. So I made this button for, for pretty much all my students, and I'm sharing it with my school. Um, the top portion is just for students to have access to things, right? I realize the best source really is Canvas. Like, that's where you guys should go. I mean, we all have videos, but this is the best thing to go to. So I made a link for the videos on Canvas, and I made the table of content for Canvas. I made one for students, and on the bottom are for the parents, okay? A lot of them are using apps, so I made sure that the links are there too. And then what's cool about our district is we actually created videos for parents. They're even translated in Spanish. So we have what we call Vista Institute for Parents. So they have access to that. Now, similarly, our high school, we teachers created videos for our students, specifically showing them how to access Canvas and how to be a digital learner. So my kids also have access to that. Um, it's called RBB Crash Course. I'll probably share that with all of you just so you can see it. Okay, and then right here on the bottom is resource page. So many of my students use different websites for their other teachers. So I'm just asking them, okay, what do you need on this page? And I'm gonna put it right there. For example, for math, we have int one, int two, and then we use no red ink and turn it in for English. The kids know that if they want me to add anything, they just email me and it will be right there, okay? And then, Zoom meeting. So when they click this, remember this is a caseload course. So I'm not doing virtual Zoom sessions on a regular. However, I did put my 22 students in different groups. I have the Monday group, which is all seniors. Then I have juniors here. And then the two um, sophomores are for Wednesday and Thursday because there's actually a lot of them. And then Friday are the individualized students that I have. Remember how I had those two boys that don't want to be seen by anyone? I actually see them individually in Friday Zoom sessions. And then if anyone wants more extra session, then they just click that. Hey, ML, I know that you talked about this earlier, but there's been some questions. Let's take again, uh, this is something that you had that has to be turned on at the admin level, right? Yes. So for example, Jennifer saying uh, this, we have extra student Canvas course, SPED teachers do not have the ability to create our own space in Canvas. How do we do that? has to be enabled by the Canvas admin, right? Yes, that would, yeah, exactly. Um, So I, what I would recommend is really talk to your SPED admin and let them know the options that you have because once they understand what you need, they're probably most likely to help you out and allow you to create new courses. Actually, our district even created this and put all the students there on their own. So that's kind of how far we've gotten for our district, so. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, okay. And then the last button, um, which is contact, very important for my kids. It shows my phone number, my email, my remind app. And then I also gave them a link to our school website, okay, that has a ton of information for them. And the two most favorite things that I have in here are the two buttons that I want them to do every Friday. So my kids get to choose to either answer, how are you? Or they, need to, they get to choose help request. So let me just show you what how are you is. 
it's a very simple way of asking and keeping track of how they're doing. They just put in their information in there. They just check. I'm great. Thanks for asking. Doing okay. And then here they can click. I'm a little stressed out. I'm sad. I'm feeling unmotivated. Then on the bottom here, it tells them, okay, so do you have any details you want to share with me? If they click no, then the form gets submitted. Then I have it in record that the kid has told me that they're okay, right? If they click yes, it means they're going to add more details to that. So let me go back here. Now, if a student actually does need help request, I made a button for that that takes them to another Google form. Let me make just make this bigger a little bit. There we go. So it's asking for their names. And then here, I want them to start thinking about self-advocating. First, before they come to me, I want to make sure, are you doing your part as a student? So as you can see, I said, hey, are you attending live sessions? Are you reading the assigned materials? Are you asking teachers for questions? So very basic things that I would normally ask them had we been talking in person, right? But I wanted to streamline the process. Then here, I said, what are you seeking help with? Is it organizing? Are you struggling? Do you need guidance with something else? or anything you want to add. And then again, self-advocacy is important for high schoolers. So I said, did you email the teacher or do they actually want to chat with me first, which is okay too. And then they get the option to add any description. And then on the bottom, I want to know, do you want me to email you? Do you want me to message you? Do you want me to call you or what do you want? So I've noticed that with high schoolers, independence is very important to them. That's why I want to make sure that they're given that option to actually decide for themselves. So yeah, that's, that's my portion. That's me, um, how I'm going to case manage in the high school setting. And then just remember that my study skills course is also looking very different than this one. ML, we've got some questions here wondering if you might be willing to share the template for your Google form by chance. Yes, I intend to do that as soon as things get slow, like slower with work right now. We just started last week, so it's a little hectic, but I will put it on um, if you're on Facebook, uh, add us on Taglish Teacher, and then if not, I'm going to put it on the comments. Awesome. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, let's go over to Kimberly. I am on the East Coast. I um, work for Durham Public Schools in elementary education in North Carolina. So you're going to see something very different because ML is a high school teacher, so she is dealing with independent learners who are literate. I work with, well, actually I have kind of a hybrid job, but don't we all right now? My position is 50% ESL and 50% EC. EC is what my state calls special education for exceptional children. So the caseload that I have is all of the students in my school my building who have IEPs and also receive ESL service. So they're English language learners who also have disabilities and I work with all of them. It's actually a, a small caseload, um, but I work with all of them first through fifth grade. So there are some very different things that we have to, rec to recognize that not only do they have disabilities, but they're also acquiring the English language. So I'm also in a dual language school. So kindergarten and first grade, well, kindergarten and first grade, nine of their day is in Spanish. So that means that they're learning literacy in Spanish, which means that they, we about literate in English because they've not been taught in English. So things that I have to take into consideration with that. Um, of my caseload, um, all but one are Spanish speakers at home. Um, most of the parents do not speak or read English. So what I have has to be very obvious to both students and parents, recognizing that small children are going to require a lot of adult support. So like I said, North Carolina calls it special education exceptional children or EC for short. Well, I wanted to call it something. They don't know that they're special ed or EC. And they've heard EC, but they don't, they don't know what that means. So I decided to call it exceptional creatures and have a theme of animals. So this is my homepage. This is the first thing that they see. And then they scroll down. And um, this used to stay, say students start here. But then again, I said, uh, there is a 
big technological divide between immigrant parents and the technology that their children are having to use. So parents were calling me day and night. I know ML said she just started last week, but this is week five for me. And the first, the week before school started and the first week of school, I was getting phone calls and text messages all hours of the day and night and all weekend long from confused um, parents and children. So I added additional content to my homepage, one being the this is this comes from a template that the district uses, so I wanted to use the same icons and make them familiar. Um, their special schedule, what special to today? So this is a link to their special schedule, um, links to their various specials classes, um, a page with my personal contact information, because let's face it, you know, I don't have a phone in the classroom if I'm sitting in my dining room. I'm giving out my personal phone number. Um, this is actually just a link right here to this inbox, which no one has used. Um, calendar and important dates. I just created a simple template using the text editor, um, just highlighting some important dates, uh, days off of school, testing days, what have you. Nothing too special. I don't know if anyone's ever read it, actually. Um, written in English and Spanish. So, um, and a, a couple of other useful links, um, a school website and um, the ESL department's website. So let's go to where the children would go. I tell them the, the star button is their start button. So click on the big green star. Again, these children aren't all literate. And they might not be literate in English. So um, pictures, picture support, lots of visual support which helps um, not only the, the literacy gap, but also those students who are visual learners. So they click on the star and um, I got the button idea from ML. Um, there was a time in early August that I decided I needed to step up my Canvas game because we are switching to Canvas. I found her Facebook group and inside of two weeks with ML's help and videos, um, got myself up to speed and built this. So buttons that I created using Canva and just like ML each student is assigned a button so I didn't email them and tell them what their buttons were because they don't have email and they might not be reading English anyway they have reading goals I mean let's face it so upon our first meeting via zoom I told them what their animals were so in terms of privacy well you know I told the whole group in front of everyone you're the bear you're the crocodile you're the dog you're the elephant so yes everyone in the group had the opportunity to hear who each other's animals were but I will tell you something these children are having such a tough time just navigating the technology that they right now they couldn't care less they could not care less what someone else's animal is because they are so worried about how to log on to Canvas to find what they need. So right now it's not a problem. I did start to password protect these buttons um, because, you know, elementary school children can get kind of cheeky and start mousing around and try to sabotage other people's work. But, you know, I just decided too many clicks. It was too many clicks and too many technological barriers right now. Well, then I will enable the password protection. So right now, simplified, reduce the student clicks. So let's take a look at what um, they're seeing. Um, so this is a much different situation than what ML showed you. Um, let's say I'm the bear. Um, what I have put in, this becomes like his personal page and just like ML did, I, there's the visual reference again that you're in the right place. This is the bear page. Um, here is a link to my Zoom in case he hasn't found me already. This is a link to his schedule. This is not a real schedule. This is this is a, a dummy schedule. And all my dummy account, my, my dummy students, first name, face name, student. So I created these personal schedules for each one of my students to help them try to navigate through their day. Yes, if they're not literate in English, then that's a problem. But for the students who, um, who need adult support, I also wrote their English for them. But for the students who are literate and at least can tell time, at least digital time, they can just go down their schedule and click, click, click. Be 
change classes throughout the day and that becomes very confusing for many of the students. So there's a schedule and um, in terms of privacy, you know what, if somebody else clicked on it, they would see his schedule and see his name on it. It wouldn't say fake student, it would have his name. So in terms of privacy, he could be breached, but again, if this becomes a problem, I will password protect it so he and only he could get into it. Um, right now, I'm not doing that. Again, like Moby Max, his username and password would be out there. Well, it's the same password for all students anyway, but the username would be out there. The username and password for the social skills program would be out there, but frankly, no one's looking at it right now because nobody can navigate the technology with um, with a lot of ease yet. So this particular student has three goals. And I use some art that for an academy. And it says goal, I tell me which one to click. And that's true. So when it's reading time, I will tell him click on number one, click on number two. If it's social skills time, I'll say click on number three. Now, if you tell a small child, click on number number three, what's he going to do? He's going to click on the number rather than the words. But what happens if he clicks on the words? Well, you just have to remove all barriers. And so I made all of it hyperlinked, the image and the text. So it doesn't matter what he clicks on, he's going to get there. I'll click on the number. So what I'm doing in my district, they have determined that asynchronous learning time does not count toward IEP minutes, service minutes we have to do face-to-face -face synchronous instruction. So then I thought, geez, how am I going to do this? I've got first or fifth graders. How am I going to like get materials to them? How are we going to work online real time? Modules for my students was not going to be the way to go um, because they're, they're not independent with the technology. And modules is really in my opinion, is a bit more for the asynchronous learning time, which we're not providing anyway. Certainly I can provide it, but that would be supplemental to IEP minutes. If I want to give it to them, then it becomes like homework and not required. Um, so I decided I, I had created some modules and then I decided, no, I'm not going to go that way. What I'm doing instead is I'm creating digital interactive notebooks. So this is um, a student who comes to this assignment, the assignment using the external tool, Google Assignments tool. And I put some text in here, make it big and obvious, you know, like 36 point text. And I dropped in an image of an arrow so that visually they'll know what to click. Without this, with a bunch of text, they're just going to be overwhelmed as text and they're just shut it out. But I'll tell you what, your children who are English can follow an arrow and they can find a button. So they click on the button and I think this one doesn't work, but he would come to a digital interactive notebook, which is one for each student who receives one. So I just created this in Google Slides and then online real can go over their schedule. This is what we're doing today. We're introducing the zones of regulation. Then we're going to practice the zones of regulation Finally, we'll write about the zones of regulation and we're working on their self-regulation and functioning skills. Scheduling is very important. And then interacting with their schedule is also very important. So I dropped some images of some transparent check marks here that they can click and drag. And the beauty of this is then I can see online real time what they're doing. So I might have a group of, I think my largest group is like seven students, if they all turn up, seven students, synchronous Zoom learning time. And so I have seven open, as well as the myriad of other tabs I already have open for other work, seven tabs open. And it's a bit like being at the kidney table and then you kind of check in with each student. Instead, I'm clicking on each tab and so each student, oh no, honey, we're on page two already. I can see you're on page one. Can you turn to page two? and I can see where they are in the notebook, and then we can work online real time. We can talk about regulation, we can talk about the behaviors and different emotions and talk about where they go and click this and drag it to the green zone. And I can watch them do this online real time, which I think is really 
thing. So when I say to my students, open your notebook, well, it's gotten a little bit confusing with this particular student. He's like, I have my notebook right here. <laughs> no, honey, that's not the one I mean. I mean the one on Canvas. So we, I can watch them type online real time. I can correct their writing. I can give them instant feedback, which is really quite a remarkable thing. Um, it works very in Google Classroom. It provides a copy of each student's notebook in my Google Drive so that I can click on all of them, I can open them all, and I can see where they are, where they need feedback. So here is the same thing with a reading notebook. Let's click on number one. reading time. He clicks on the number one. This one does work. I don't know what happened to the other one. Um, this is just a dummy course, so I have no students loaded into course. This is just one for me to play with, but normally what you would see is you would see right in the middle, you would see um, the icon for Google Slides and the student's name, and then the title of the notebook, which I think I called Reading Digital Notebook. So here is a copy of our very first Reading Digital Notebook, which again, there's that schedule, there's that agenda, and it was just a notebook that I used to teach them how to use a notebook that they can pick it up and they can click it and drag it and just just play with it. Which one's your animal? I'm the bear, that kind of thing. They can just learn how to navigate this. Um, sentence starters, sentence stems, and they can finish the writing. Congratulations, let's go back and check your schedule. They can move the check marks and then that's where we, okay, tomorrow, we're going to be meet back here at 9.30. What time are we meeting tomorrow? And we make sure that they, everyone understands it. This is basically what it looks like for most of my students. Some of my students only have one goal. So their pages look a little bit different, but they don't have the one, two, three. They just have the one goal that they're working on. I think this one just has one goal. And so this student would come here. I didn't finish putting in the imagery for the schedule, but um, this one says click your animal to find your So this student's going to click the animal to find the work, clicking a goal number because this student only has one goal. So that's it, fewer clicks for this student. A way that very young students can still use Canvas and not even be literate. We have to reduce the number of clicks for them, use a lot of imagery. Um, I saw a question to ML a while back about taking data. This is also an op opportunity for me to take data. So what I do with these notebooks is offline. When the students are offline, more work in there. So this is like a beginning how to use a digital notebook. notebook. But then when we're actually working on reading goals, I'll drop some short vowels work in there. So when we're working on short vowels, I'll say, you know, turn to page two, let's start working on the short A. And I might have a short A assessment in there and, ha and put that in there. And then I'll put a little text box in, in there to, with, with, so that I know that this is the date that I took data on this student's knowledge of the short A. We know where they are, now I know where to go. And this is a place where I, it's one thing, I just keep dropping more work in there, more assessments, and it becomes like a portfolio of their work. So that's how I am using Canvas to case manage for elementary special ed. Awesome, awesome. So question here for potentially ML or Kimberly, whoever wants to take it. ML, I'm gonna unmute you right now. Cross-listing, this one's from my friend Winnie. Hey Winnie, thanks for coming. Cross-listing uses groups when teachers wanna share course content across the same courses. That makes using other secondary groups for clustering SPED students challenging. Any suggestions? Well, we received an email from our um, um, technology department um, cautioning us to not cross-list once you have students populated into your course and once you've become, begun instruction that it will um, it would not will not go well that if we're going to cross list we are to do it over the summer when we have no students currently enrolled. 
so for us um it, it it's a it's a it's an option for the teachers if they want to cross list um i don't think it it has affected us negatively actually I, I think the issue is if you want to share a course that you all pull something from then that doesn't need to be cross-listed. What you could all do is create that one course and then add all the teachers that you want to share content with. And then they just take out from that. Like for example, for us, I, I used to co-teach in math. So I have access to a Canvas course in integrated math one. And whenever I see anything that I would like for my kids, I take it and I put it in my study skills class or I assign it to the kid in my caseload course. So um, I actually like cross-listing. If I, if I was teaching, four similar classes, I would totally cross this. That way I can just push out the same assignments to different sections. I think the key with cross-listing, just so anybody who's listening is aware, just make sure that you check in with your Canvas admin before you do it, um, because the, the benefits are incredible. However, it, yes, it could get some things a little bit tricky and difficult if, if the Canvas admin doesn't have it set up the right way. So do that, please. This is fantastic. Any other questions from the group? We've had a big and and very engaged audience, we could call them over the past little bit, which has been fun. But if there's any specific questions for Kimberly or ML, we'd love to take them for the next couple of minutes. Okay, Ashley here on YouTube is saying, any idea on how inclusion teachers or co-teachers can get notification on specific students, not the whole class? I, I don't know about this one. I usually just um, prefer an email or a remind from the teachers. I don't know if we can actually, I know we can change the notifications in there, but so far, whatever I put notification on, I get it from all the teachers that I have it. Can, can you actually, you can individualize it. Can you mark like one course, you can only get one notification? I don't think so. I, I don't think that's an option. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah. I don't think so. I would just actually, what I would normally do is I would email all. So at the beginning of the school year, I email all my teachers and send them their IEP at a glance. And then from there is when I say, okay, if you have any questions, please reply to this email. That way I keep track of the same group of teachers and then putting it all in almost one discussion page. So everything's there. The IEP at a glance is there. All the teachers are there. And any questions about that kid is in that one email. Okay, I'm putting something in right now. We had somebody, Barbara was asking what's cross-listing. And I am putting a video in the chat right now. Take a look at that and that'll help you out. Okay, Rochelle on YouTube is asking here about how long does it take for you to set up your classes? Ooh, that, that, one, is, uh, <laughs> that one is loaded. Um, let's see, yeah. uh, when I started, uh, I would say way over three hours, to be honest with you. However, I've been creating Canvas courses for other teachers, like like everywhere, and about three is good. But if you really want it detailed, about five. But but don't please don't be discouraged because honestly, once it's set up, everything's gonna flow like the way you want it. You just all I did now is I just put an assignment and I just start publish and publish. It gets easier. The beginning is always harder, like for any task mm -hmm. anyway. So. That's how special education is always, right, Kimberly? I, I agree. Um, I, I think it, it depends on your level of um, knowledge of Canvas and your level of comfort with Canvas. I started, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I saw Canvas in my, um, in our NCA club back in March and I decided to dabble and I thought, mm, no, that's not for me. And um, then I got the email in like late May that we were going to Canvas. I was like, oh, geez, all right. So, you know, I watched a few YouTube videos. And I'm like, okay, maybe later. I don't know. I have to close out my school year and I have so many other things to do right now. So I took my summer and, and I had a summer. And then um, I ended up getting hired by the district to create Canvas course shells for an online academy. And um, I, I was one of the course designers the shells, I was there um, more as a consultant from the perspective of ESL and EC. But, um, you know, that kind of lit a fire under my butt that I need to get my act together. So I ended up finding um, ML's Facebook group for Canvas for Special Ed. And I spent a long time learning about it because I, at the beginning, I didn't know the difference among a course and an assignment and a module. And I didn't know what all these things were. 
So certainly there's a learning curve. And between the learning curve of all of that and all the language and all the functionality this is so robust, um, it took me about two weeks to build my Canvas course as it is now because I started building uh, modules that I determined that mm, for my students, modules isn't the way to go. And it took me to figure out assignments and the right kind to give to them for the right outcome that I was looking for. But certainly, if you're an expert at Canvas, probably, you know, three hours would probably do it. But if you have no idea what you're doing, like, like I had no idea what I was doing, two weeks is, is what it took me. So a couple of things to think about, everybody. I hope everyone who's listening in on here is aware of the Canvas Commons. Um, the Canvas Commons is essentially a place where excellent educators like all of you on here can go and share courses and templates and everything else so that we can make it easier for everyone else. Um, there was a question here about, are any of these courses, Kimberly or ML, have you shared any of yours through the Commons? I So my district hired me to create two for our district. Um, I do have a very simple one under Padlet feature, although I do intend to post something pretty soon. That's, you know, that's, there's still some buttons, but not as, 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 as detail as mine, but I do plan to do that to help out our viewers here. Awesome. I have not. Um, my district created um, Canvas courses, course shells for, well, for everything. It's a K-12, pre-K-12 district. So they have a course shell for everything. And so it becomes quite overwhelming. So I have not shared it with the um, comments and nobody has asked me to. So I have not, I've not done that. Share it. <laughs> Share it. Anybody who's listening, the more sharing we can do on there, the easier it is for everybody else. Okay, let's take another question and then ML is gonna share some of her study skills as well. Uh, Nicole here on Facebook is saying, any tips for gen ed teachers with inclusion students? I would say first, make sure that you have their IEP summary. Read everything, the biggest, biggest thing is the accommodation. We recognize a lot of us are virtual online, right? So it's not gonna be as easy, but extended time for sure, you need to make sure you provide that. And then if you have any like immersive reader, make sure that's activated. Um, read aloud if, if uh, because only read aloud can actually check assignments and the quizzes. So there are many tools out there, but I would recommend that you guys coordinate with your um, special education teachers and ask them for ideas. Our school, I made one um, one resource for all the general teachers that gives them ideas on what they can do for our kids. So. Check with your department, but um, if that's something that I could share also, i probably share it. And I see Winnie already saying there. I'll share. Uh, I'll just, I'll go find time at one point to share everything that I have. Love it. Love it, love it. Okay, Emma, let's have you share. I know you're gonna share some study skill stuff. Yeah, let me, um, let me just really quick share that. Okay, so um, as you can see, like, this is an actually live course, so let me be careful. Um, so this is a live course. So this, again, like what I said, some of my students are in my study skills and then some of them are in another teacher's study skills. So the way that works is I will be communicating with those teachers about what my my kids on my case will be doing. But if you were in my study skills, this is how it works. So they would click class lessons. Okay, well actually let me show the whole thing. So class lessons right there and then we have scheduled for the math lab. This is the same group that I showed earlier because about half of these kids are on my caseload, okay? So they click class lessons and then here it's going to take them to announcements which they check daily. And then the bottom portion are things that we do in class. So, you know, like certain days we're doing read works for about 15 minutes and then certain days we're doing no red ink, certain days we're doing CK12 and then Khan Academy. So I created an agenda that stays the same every single day, okay? And then th this is just a link of all the previous lessons that we've had. So all I did is I, I linked this button to module for week one. But let me show you how it looks. You're probably gonna see my lessons today. <laughs> all right, so um, let me actually make it a little smaller. So it's, it's just a bunch of activities that I wanted my kids to do. So for example, this was actually week one. So we focus on, you know, Zoom etiquette and then videos that are that I, that I want them to see. And then it's arranged by day. And then when I'm done with it, I tell the students, okay, just collapse that. 
Okay, and then the first thing that they will see this morning when they log on will be September 7 to 11, which shows them all the assignments that they need to do. Oops, sorry, uh, the other week actually. So that's pretty much how my study skills looks like. Um, you know, it really varies and then, but it's similar to the other one where it has information about this class, school info, which is all the Canvas help page. But the main thing for me is in high school, I, I feel pretty confident using modules and that's kind of how I organize my stuff. So yeah. Love it. One more question for both of you. And I'm gonna start with ML and then I'll go over Kimberly and unmute you. ML, so there was a question here about buttons, um, which seems to be a big question everywhere. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna give you my thoughts. I am a huge fan of Canva. Um, so easy to use, whether you're a designer or not. Um, it's very hard to mess up. I'm obviously, I have a lot of Adobe background because that's where I spent about 10 years of my career. Um, and so I love all the stuff that you can do there. But those are two places that I would look at at creating buttons. What about you, ML? What do you do? Yeah, so I actually did use Canva, um, but you can also do it in Google Drawings if you wanted something a lot simpler. But Canva is really amazing. I love it. Um, the only thing that I would recommend when you download these images, please download them in low resolution. That way, when students get them and they don't have a fast internet or they're having to pay for that, it's not taking so much of their time letting your amazing, you know, perfect images load. So I would really make it low resolution and just only use buttons when you must. Otherwise, you can use tables. You can use words and type it in there. Kimberly, what about you? Um, like I said, I did Canva to create the animal buttons, but I have another course that I share with a colleague for ESL because I also see students who do not have IEPs who are ESL only. So she and I share a course for that. Um, and for that, we... If we've got a large caseload, we have uh, 60 something students. So they're in groups. So um, they're in colored groups. And so like made a yellow button. I didn't use Canva for that because Canva is kind of, you know, like robot. I used um, a website called um, Da Button Factory, D-A Button Factory. Oh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so then you can put text um, text, and then just copy and paste the button. Then it's inherently a low resolution image um, and you don't even, you can just right click and copy and paste it. And of course, if you want to make it an image because you're going to be uploading it a lot, using it a lot in Canvas, it'd be a good idea to download it as an image. But frankly, I just right clicked on it Image, image, pasted it in a table in um, in Canvas, and just did simple circle buttons, making the height, the, the pixel height and width equal. That's how you get a circle. There's a, there are two choices. There's like a rectangle and a rounded rectangle or something, and using the rounded one, making the the height and the width equal, you get a circle. So we made circle buttons there, but you know, like you can do whatever shape you want, and that's what we chose to do. I love this comment from Anne on Facebook. Thank you, Amel and Kimberly. You guys are incredible. Winnie's giving us another good shout out here. Thank you very much. Great job. Lots to think about. Awesome. And I especially love this comment from our friend Maureen. I mean, this is kind of cool. You're right, Maureen. This is not only kind of cool, this is epically cool. So ML, why don't you wrap this whole thing up with us? Okay. So um, I just wanted to, you know, like, again, thank you, everyone. I know special education teachers have been working so hard preparing for everything. What what everybody needs to understand is on top of us having to do Canvas, we're also having to worry about case managing. And that's a big topic that I'm sure you all know about. So, you know, just take it easy. Um, do it one step at a time. And, you know, there are many videos out there. Uh, there are many tutorial videos that can help you. But I think personally for me, what I would recommend is draw and write things down first. Create what you want to create, write it down, draw it, and then go to Canvas when you're ready. Because when you're ready and ideas start flying in, then you can start creating a beautiful Canvas that you would like to show to your kids. So, yeah. Love it. Love it, love it. Some great comments coming in about how awesome you two are. Thanks again. I feel like Kimberly and ML need to be joining us on here more regularly. So I will take that upon myself to see what kind of convincing I need to do. They were fantastic. And we've obviously got a, a great groom, a group of special education teachers who are wanting more and more help. So let's make it happen. Thanks everyone for being with us. We're back again tomorrow morning at 1030. 
a.m. Mountain Time. Talk to you soon. Bye.